Hi, welcome back. So this is the final uh, week of this course on Marxist philosophy. And this week we're going to be talking about something quite different to what we've talked about in previous weeks, which is the question of morality. Not something really that Marxists talk about that often. Why is that? Well, Marx once said quite famously that, and I quote, in all ideology, men and their circumstances appear upside down as in a camera obscura. He also famously explained that uh, in any class society, the ruling ideas are always those of the ruling class. So in other words, the dominant ideas of a given society are not only those of the ruling class, but they're an, they are they obscure the real relations, the real characteristics of that society. They present them in a topsy-turvy and in a false way. And he also said that we should never judge a man by what he thinks about himself, but by what he does. And similarly, he says that one cannot judge such a period of transformation by its own consciousness. In other words, to really understand a society, we shouldn't pay too much attention to what it thinks and says about itself. In other words, its ideology, but examine the real material basis of that society and exactly what it really does. And I would say that the more close to politics a given idea or area of human thought is, the more distorted it will be. So for example, uh, bourgeois economics, the economics that you're taught at, at university, for example, is pretty openly a distortion of reality. I mean, it's just a blatant apology for capitalism. It's not, not really a scientific theory at all. Um, and, uh, and I would say the same applies for morality. Morality has always been uh, underclass society. When I talk about morality, I mean the major philosophical theories of morality and also the dominant values, the moral values of a given society. These have always served the purpose of justifying the rule of the ruling class and of um, and, and of the mode of production that presently exists and of obscuring the real injustices of that society. And the way it does this in, in general um, is through obfuscation, is abstractness, blurring uh, and even ignoring the real class contradictions and injustices of society. That's the main uh, approach of, of all the moral theories, no matter how different they are, they really all have that in common. Um, they never start out from an analysis of the unequal and exploitative character of the society that they are, that their authors uh, or practitioners uh, belong to. They always take that for granted, they never question that. They never say, for example, uh, or, or start out by saying, uh, can this society allow people to behave in a moral way? Is it really possible in a capitalist society or in a feudal society for people to obey uh, the moral rules that we set them? Um, and is that justified, therefore? Do we need to change that society? They never, they never really look at that. Everything is looked at from the point of view of the individual and their behaviour. And the social context in which they live is generally ignored entirely. Um, and so in this way, it kind of justifies uh, the, the, the unjustif unjustifiable character of class society. Um, now, throughout most human history, this, this morality, this official morality, was, of course, a religious one. And this, this dominant ideology of religion that you had, this kind of illusion which held society together with all of its massive contradictions and injustices, of course, it had recourse to an external power to explain and justify everything. In other words, an almighty God or a group of gods greater than society, greater than individuals, was timeless, eternal. And it really defined what, what was right and what was wrong. And you couldn't really question this for fear, of course, of eternal punishment by those very gods themselves. And so what was really happening with this ideology is that the real foundations of society, again, were being ignored. Um, but in reality, it was is those material foundations of society, whether it be feudal or slave society or capitalist, that the structure 
of that mode of production ultimately is what gave rise to certain kinds of behavior, certain expectations or norms, such as, you know, a certain kind of family structure and sexual relations, for example. Um, and it's that that really produces this, this the, the need for these moral codes, which are then sanctified and made eternal by this uh, God. The most obvious example of this, I suppose, is the question of theft, because obviously if you live in a society without private property and inequality, you don't need a moral code against theft. In fact, theft itself is not really, um, doesn't really make any sense. The, the concept probably wouldn't even exist. So the commandment not to, not never to steal uh, is a product of a pre-existing social development in which you get, of course, not only private property, but massively unequally distributed private property. That's what gives rise to the ability even to have a concept of theft. And then, of course, the widespread um, behaviour of thieving, of course, is, is, is made unavoidable, really, by the massive inequality of, of, of such societies, right? So that's the real uh, genesis and basis for that uh, moral code. But it's then presented as if it comes from heaven and is absolutely eternal, of course, and that gives it a, a, a basically serves to, to justify and sanctify the the, um, the inequality of that society. Um, and I would say that for the same reason that this moral code was always false and topsy-turvy and ignored the real basis of, of those moral uh, norms, uh, for that same reason, such um, commandments or moral codes have always been ignored. They've never, there's no moral code that any society has developed, any class society anyway has developed, that has been by and large adhered to basically. All of these rules are routinely flouted. Um, hypocrisy is really the watchword of any class society, including capitalism. You know, every ruling class in history has practiced um, war, wars of conquest, which involve killing, obviously, um, thievery, and, and lying as well. All of those things are really absolutely integral to fighting any war by a ruling class. Um, and of course, ruling classes throughout history infamous, are infamous for their adulteration, their keeping of mistresses, and of course also their greed, all of which are you know, officially wrong in pretty much any religious um, moral code. And yet all of them are pretty much routinely ignored by the ruling class of that society. So hypocrisy is the defining feature really of morality, or of official morality, shall we say. And that's the case today, very much so. We're all probably aware of, you know, the, 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 the political hypocrisy that we see around us. And again, it stretches into morality. I'll just give some examples. Just yesterday I saw that the, in Britain, the Archbishop of Canterbury uh, declared in defence of Prince Andrew and his alleged uh, behaviour that, you know, we mustn't demand that our royals be superhuman. So in other words, it's... Uh, it's superhuman behaviour not to engage in the kind of practices he is thought to have engaged in, um, which is a ridiculous thing to say. It's quite obvious um, hypocrisy, a defence of, of a fellow member of the ruling class, double standards to say the least. Um, we also have another example from Britain, which was when Jeremy Corbyn was leader of the Labour Party. You had a relentless campaign against the alleged anti-Semitism in the party, no Blairite MP could help themselves but to give issue sort of moral indignation at you know their shock and horror at the fact that the Labour Party could have so much racism within it. Of course, all of this was just blatant lies, just drummed up to serve a political purpose. And now that he has gone and we have a Blairite uh, at the helm, suddenly all of those problems have disappeared. And uh, suddenly the, the wave of... of, of anti-Semitism from Labour members you don't hear anything about. And on the other hand, you have all of those people named in the leaked report and absolutely nothing is done about any of that. The hypocrisy is, is, is glaring. I also remember participating in a debate a few years ago with a priest. And at some point the priest was asked, I think the person who asked was a member of his congregation and it was a leading question intended to make... Um, the Marxists look like bloodthirsty cynics, um, or ideologues rather. And the question was, 
would you ever be prepared to kill for your beliefs? In other words, would you impose with violence your beliefs onto society? And of course, the implication is that Marx says, yes, that's what they believe in. And the priest very sanctimoniously replied, no, I would never kill from their beliefs. I think that's completely wrong. Later in the debate, someone also asked him, did you support the Iraq war? And he said, yes. Now, what do you think? He, do you think he thought that the Iraq war would not involve anybody dying, anybody being killed? Um, I don't think so. So clearly it was a very hypocritical position. He does believe in killing to further your ends, whether or not those ends are justified is a separate question. He does believe in that. But he very sanctimoniously declared that he did not believe in that and that really anyone who does must be a bloodthirsty ideologue. So you, you have this kind of hypocrisy everywhere in capitalist society. It's unavoidable. It's a product of the injustice of that system. Now, with the bourgeois enlightenment, bourgeois revolution, human thought took a, a big step forward and um, materialism was revived. And this reflected itself in the moral theories, which no longer saw God um, and ancient dogma as a sufficient basis for, for a moral code. And, and, and it, instead, a, a sort of rational basis for moral behaviour was sought. And I suppose that was a step forward. How, however, it has to be said that their efforts were really just as abstract and uh, as ahistorical as the religious ones, in the same kind of way that the ideals of the bourgeois revolution, you know, of establishing an age of reason and of uh, equality, those, those were always, as Marx explained, very abstract and could not really find realisation because capitalist society is just another class society based on a new form of exploitation. And in the same way, these moral codes were, yes, they didn't, Based themselves on God, but they were equally abstract and ahistorical and therefore could never really be applied and indeed they never really have been followed. Um, there, were, there were really two main trends to bourgeois, um, bourgeois moral philosophy, which is Kantianism and utilitarianism. As I said, they're both very abstract and they, they search for a sort of timeless moral code which will always be valid. Now, let's start with Kant's one, the, the categorical imperative. And this teaches us that um, to establish any kind of maxim of behaviour, meaning like a rule, uh, a, a, mor a moral rule of behaviour, what we have to do is, is search for a principle that is universalizable. So, in other words, uh, you take a kind of behaviour such as lying, is that universalizable? In other words, would it be good if everybody lied? Well, clearly not. Would it be very good if people told the truth? Well, you'd be inclined to say yes. So that's the, the rational basis for your rule that society has, or members of society must abide by in order to be moral. It's the abstractness of this is, is, is obvious, right? First of all, like I said, no one ever really thought, very few people seriously follow such a rigid guideline. But also it's, it's obvious that um, it, it's not even really true as an ideal, regardless of whether or not such an ideal can be maintained. Clearly, lying in some circumstances is not only not bad, but very good. If, for example, a group of slaves get together and uh, deceive their master, in other words, lie to their master, their owner, in order to free themselves, would that be a good or a bad thing? I think we'd all say it's definitely a good thing. So this search for a kind of abstract and finished once and for all given rule which must always be obeyed is is totally uh, false and, and um, yeah, it can never be adhered to but it doesn't even make sense. What it really is is kind of in my view it's it's like this kind of morality is it's, it's like the hypocritical morality of a priest issuing a sermon to a bunch of um, respectable ladies and gentlemen, bourgeois ladies and gentlemen who are you know very keen to maintain the appearance of always saying the right thing uh, and would never admit to lying or any kind of wrong behaviour, you know, very keen to observe the norms. But in reality, you know, they pay other people to do all of their dirty deeds for them. And um, that's, to, to my mind, what this morality really represents. And then we have utilitarianism. Now, this does at least have the merit of flexibility. Um, here we have the basic rule being there's really just one rule of utilitarianism, which is that uh, there almost is no rule. Just do whatever produces the most happiness. That's the basic rule of utilitarianism. So the ends justify the means. In other words, by all means kill people 
if that is the course of action which will produce the most happiness for the greatest number of people. Now the trouble with utilitarianism is that it's no less abstract and ahistorical despite its flexibility than any of the other theories. Maybe we agree with this idea of flexibility, but the point is it stops just at the point when the theory should start. In other words, it should start by beginning to answer the question of what it is that produces the most happiness. And implied within utilitarianism is a sort of naive idea that, um, that there could be found a kind of neutral equation or something, which we can, so long as we feed in sufficient data, it will, you know, um, decisively prove what is the most, what, what course of action will produce the most pleasure or the most happiness. And then we can just follow that. It will, it will all work out very well. But of course, that's absurd, right? It's not as if, um, you know, in class society, the idea of such a neutral thing is absurd. As if, you know, um, uh, the working class or anyone who doesn't agree with, uh, you know, what's going on in society can go to some sort of neutral court of class society and present to them the theory of utilitarianism and show, well, look, austerity and all these other things, these are not producing the most happiness and therefore they're wrong, so they must be stopped. And then the court says, well, yes, we, you've proven it with the uh, indisputable logic of utilitarianism, so we must stop it. The very idea is ridiculous, obviously. The bourgeoisie, basically, and I think really everyone, really, despite what they might say, follows this idea that uh, the ends justify the means and we have to do whatever produces the most happiness. Um, yeah, everyone really thinks that, but the point is, what no one agrees with is what will produce the most happiness. And the capitalists tell us that uh, austerity may have some unpleasant side effects, increasing inequality, etc. But, you know, it's necessary because ultimately that will produce a richer and a happier society. Or invading another country to spread democracy, that also is uh, the right thing to do. But of course, the whole point is that these things reflect their interests in truth and not the interests of society as a whole and certainly not the interests of the working class. As I said, the working class cannot then disprove these ideas. There is no neutral court of class society that will listen to them much less that it has the power to carry out any decisions. So, <clears throat> as Trotsky pointed out, uh, the real question is not whether the ends justify the means. As I said, I think most people or pretty much everyone really follows that. The real question is uh, what justifies the ends? Uh, is the end the continuation of capitalism or its replacement with socialism, for example? Um, so Marxists do basically agree that the ends justify the means, but of course our ends are the establishment of socialism, and for us everything is subordinated to that. That doesn't mean that we're bloodthirsty ideologues who are, will always kill for what we, you know, what we believe in, because it doesn't follow that just because the ends justify the means, any course of action is, is correct. Of course, you have to, to, to follow what best serves your ends, right? What, for us, what best raise class, raises class consciousness and, and increases the power of the proletariat. Um, so it doesn't necessarily follow that that involves anything unpleasant at all. But yes, for us, the ends do justify the means. So <clears throat> any scientific theory of morality for us is it has to be materialist and it must basically say the truth, which is that there is no such thing as an eternal or timeless morality. There's no morality that comes from somehow outside of society and to which all societies must adhere and everyone in society must adhere to as well. There are different societies with different moralities and they could only have those moralities that they do have. Morality is a product of a given set of social relations. Now, it is true that there are some moral codes which you'll probably find more or less in common between all societies, but that only shows that there are some common features to all societies. For example, you wouldn't be very likely to find any moral code that says you should always kill people. Of course, it's not really very beneficial to any society for people to be doing that. But nevertheless, yes, uh, the, the moral code flows from the relations of that society, the social relations, and they change as those social relations change. Not only that, but within a given society as well, there is more than one morality because there are different classes with different interests. So in other words, there is the morality of the picket line. 
And the morality of the picket line involves things like so obviously solidarity, you know, collectively fighting together, but also, you know, fighting against anyone who tries to break that solidarity, obviously a strike breaker or a scab. And for, for the working class, that morality is very good. In fact, it's the highest kind of morality. But uh, for the capitalists, they, for them, uh, the, the morality of the picket line is thuggery, and that is how they present it. There is, the point is there's no way of finding a common agreement between these two moralities. The bourgeoisie can only have their morality, the morality of the individual, basically. Uh, and the working class has to have its own morality. It has to struggle for that morality. And that's what our fight is all about. So we, we don't have any illusions about morality. We know what it, you know that it's broken all the time and that class society requires it to be broken. What we're really interested in is not establishing some sort of ethical code that we try to foist onto people, but instead we're interested in understanding why it is that class society and specifically capitalism make people behave so immorally all the time, or, or rather make people break the professed morality of, of their society. Why there is so much injustice, hypocrisy, why there are so many crimes in society and why these never seem to be able to be dealt with and why, why the rich and powerful always get away with behaving uh, in the most immoral way or in the most hypocritical way. So for us, the highest moral principle is really simply whatever serves best the interests of the proletariat, whatever hastens the emancipation of the working class and ultimately humanity, from class society. That is what is moral. And everything else is just, you know, fig leaves and, uh, and illusions, basically. Lenin stated that without revolutionary theory, there can be no revolutionary movement. Without a revolutionary theory, we are bound to take in the ideas that surround us. Under capitalism, these are ideas that ultimately defend the status quo. In Wellrad's upcoming book on the history of philosophy, Alan Woods looks at the development of philosophical thinking from the ancient Greeks all the way through to Marx and Engels, who brought together the best of previous thinking to produce the Marxist philosophical outlook, which looks at the real material world, not as a static, immovable reality, but one that is constantly changing and moving according to laws that can be discovered. Through this, we can learn how philosophy becomes an indispensable tool in the struggle for the revolutionary transformation of society. Pre-order your copy now at www.marxist.com/hop.